Can you hear me okay? Yep, good. Okay, so as I'm going to be talking to you about drone survey mapping um, and legal deforestation detection, I thought the first thing I'd do is introduce you to our drone. Ta-da! I brought props because I live here. Um, so this is a very lightweight, this is our drone, and this is an EB+, plus, um, and that's pretty much all she'll do. Um, I did get clearance to kind of start her up in here from health and safety, but my risk assessment said no is a little bit too dangerous. Um, so, so she's just going to sit there. Um, but she accompanied, uh, just use this, that right um, she she accompanied us on our expedition to Madagascar earlier in this year which we led to look at this illegal deforestation that is taking place um, in that expedition there were 20 of us staff that went so there was two staff from Q that was me and my colleague Tim and there were 18 from the local and regional organizations which are Nitan and Sika and Feedback Madagascar in addition to all those staff we had um, a local um, community group and the youth group that did the cooking for us because we were camping and also we had local guys to take us through the forests and as well as that we had numerous porters and you can see them all touring through there with lots of our kit and um, the drone had lots of kit to go with it. Um, you'll all have known and seen like some really amazing drone footage it's kind of there's brilliant footage of kind of wide sweeping landscapes that you'll see um, wildlife documentaries, they all show really amazing drone footage. And most of this footage is taken from a helicopter-like kind of quadcopter. Um, so either quadcopter or an octocopter, but it's got kind of multiple rotors, it hovers really nicely, it zooms around, it gives you these really gorgeous shots kind of looking out at the surface and looking out at the environment in front of you. Um, drone surveying, how, however, for survey mapping is slightly a bit, kind of a bit of a different science. Um, as you see, our drone only has one rotor. Um, it's at the back, so you probably actually can't see it, but it's just got the one. It's fixed wing, so it's a bit more like a plane. Uh, we set it to a uh, kind of a, a set flight height that it's running at, and that enables us to make sure that all our pictures are of the same size. The camera in it is below it, so you can't see it's in it, and that will be looking down or almost directly down at the ground. And that gives us a good kind of image that we're looking at. Also, we're not flying around, we're not manually flying it and kind of taking kind of weird angles. It's really just on a flight path that we set. So the flight path goes out and we take overlapping pictures as it's moving away from us or kind of on its line and then have overlaps in between those flights as well. So with these overlapping photographs, it's enabled us to build like a 3D image or kind of a 3D model of the area that we're looking at. Um, so that's kind of the droning. And what I'd like to do for this presentation is really taking you through kind of that process, kind of like a crash course in drone for kind of illegal monitoring in the forest. So that's what I'm kind of going to go through with you. Um, so the forest in Madagascar. Um, so Madagascar, the fourth largest island in the world, and it's an amazing island. If you ever get to go there, you'll have a brilliant time. There's everything amazing about it. Um, and it's full of biodiversity. It's got really really full of endemics but of course all of this means it's very much at risk there's unprecedented deforestation in madagascar has been happening for many many years in the tropical forests so much so that 80 percent of the original forest is lost and 33 percent of that has happened in since the 70s a lot of that is is similar world over it's caused by kind of commercial agriculture logging um, kind of energy supply but for madagascar kind of more specifically, it's predominantly that 18 million people that rely on it for subsistence. Um, just to kind of give you a little bit of information, charcoal that's burnt in kind of urban areas, 90% of that energy um, for those urban areas comes from the charcoal that's developed or kind of taken and 75% of that charcoal is supplied illegally. So it's a big, big problem, but there's massive demands on this forest. So just to show you where the forest is in Madagascar, you can see a little spine that runs down on the east and it gives way further west as you're going over to the central highlands and then it kind of leads into the dry forest in the west there. So we took our journey to Ambohima Hamasana um, in the Kofav forest area of Madagascar and this is one of the last intact remaining kind of forest corridors that exist in this protected area. Um, the area that you're looking at um, is really important biodiversities, kind of en endemics, but also, as well as that, it's really, really important to the vital fresh water source. Um, so this area is really, really important. Again, deforestation is mostly for subsistence. In this area, it's largely to do with rice paddy fields. So you have a look at this area, you can see that most of the little forest cuts that have been taken out, a lot of those are occurring in those valley areas. So as well as taking out the forest, kind of the locals are really, really exploiting kind of that natural water source that they've got there as well. 
I just wait for that to roll around and finish. Um, but the communities in Madagascar, here in this area that we were looking at, um, as well as kind of partially kind of deforesting their forest, they invited us in. So when we were kind of said we were doing this research, lots of communities invited us in to come and do our research in their location. Um, so they wanted us there. And, and whilst we were there, one of the first things we do when we arrive in the forest is, uh, which will be the next slide, okay, arrive in the forest, uh, we talk to the local elders and the local people. We tell them what we're doing, what the research that we're doing there. We do a little drone flight, which I can't do here, um, to show them exactly what it's like. A lot of them were scared. They thought they might be scared of the drone. They don't really see planes very often. Um, but also enabled them to kind of ask a whole bunch of questions, what they want to know about what we're doing. Um, one of the initial things we also do when we arrived on site was to put in a drop toilet. Um, none of these communities have toilets, so it was kind of the first for them. Um, but one of the main questions, or one of the first questions that the elders asked when we arrived in this area was, will the drone be able to see someone in that toilet? <laughs> um, and at eight and a half centimetres resolution, you actually probably could see someone in the loo, but I reassured them you probably wouldn't know who it was, unless they were wearing a really bright coloured hat, which actually could happen in these lot of these pictures, so they might know who they were. So once we're on site and we've kind of developed what we are and we're almost ready to go, we need to kind of go through flight planning. Um, some of this initially happens before you leave for Madagascar or leave on a trip. Um, so we kind of identified where we might want to go, kind of the flight height, the resolution we're looking at, the area that we want to survey. Um, and that's kind of done in situ. Uh, um, at Q, and they will download our imagery and also our digital elevation models so that they can help with the flights. But most of the planning is actually done locally on site. Um, so when we get to site, we identify where we're going to have our landing zones, where we're going to have our takeoff zones. We identify kind of if there's going to be any wind issues. We always want to fly or take off or land into the wind, so we kind of plan that in. But also in this particular project, we had three roaming teams as well. Now those roaming teams were sent off on a daily basis with a GPS, a walkie-talkies, and directions from me as to where in the forest they should go. And you see kind of little team locations on that picture there. So what these roaming teams enabled us to do is to fly much further than my visible eye or co-pilot Tim visible eye could actually see so they would be our eyes kind of in the sky or on the ground looking at the drone and their main job was to keep eyes on the drone and look out for any threats and those main threats would come in the format of weather rain not good for the drone and low cloud not very good um, neither of those are particularly good for the drone but we're not going to get any good imagery from that either so if any of those situations arise or they could see the weather systems coming in they'd get on the radio, tell back to me, and I'd abort the mission, and then we'd have to refly that area another time with, without those conditions. But the main threat, birds. Birds love the drone, and uh, especially those really nice big birds of prey with really massive talons. <laughs> and with uh, a lovely polystyrene drone, it's not going to end well for us. Um, so we have to kind of go through particular manoeuvres to make sure that the drone doesn't get attacked and those birds realise that it's not really a bird for them to be kind of messing with. So we have evasive manoeuvres that we run through. But that again would be those teams getting on the ground. There's a bird getting really close. Um, okay, we hit those manoeuvres and make sure, and, uh, yeah, okay, the bird's lost interest. Okay, that's good, then can carry on. Um, so that's kind of mainly what our, our teams on the ground. There's constant radio contact it was all pretty much in malagasy until i needed to know something in eager so they they would talk to themselves and the teams yes the drone's coming over here or it's going into the next zone have you picked it up yes we've picked it up it's safe okay it's coming back to the ground so they'd always be in constant communication that we or i knew the drone was always safe if, a, if there was a threat they'd let me know and it was never going to go out of kind of eye shot of anyone so there's always kind of eyes on that drone so now that everything's kind of set up, we set our flight path, we know where we're going, everybody knows what they're doing, then we need to go ahead and actually start the drone or kind of get the drone ready for uh, its takeoff. Um, so the drone itself, as you can see there, um, it's fairly small and fairly kind of portable, um, but it has breakable pieces on it. So to get it started, we take it out of the box, pop the wings on, put the propeller on, and that's pretty much it. When we've checked it over to make sure that that's all intact, put the battery in. When the battery goes in, it then kicks off and it starts and it links to our sensor on our computer. So once that's gone through and it's all connected really nicely, we then upload the flight path that we've predetermined, send that to the drone, and then that's ready to fly. To send it off to flight, three, three quick shakes, um, rapid shakes to get it started. The engine whirs up and then off it goes. And Tim is going to show you exactly how that works. Uh, that's pretty much it. 
um, and then it flies off for a really long time. Um, so whilst it's flying off, everyone's got eyes on. So we've got people with binoculars, people watching it. Uh, in the air, of, of course, everyone's going to be looking out for those threats and identify it. But we also need to be monitoring um, the drone itself. So we want to have a look at its status and see what it's doing. Um, so there's a lot of checks that we're going to do for that. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a kind of a, a flight simulation of what the drone actually looks like, what the software looks like when I am flying that drone. So I've sent the flight path to the drone and it's happy with that. Tim has got it up whirring and it's ready to go. Caution. Motors will start spinning. And obviously it is moving, but you can't hear it. Um, so this is spinning and it's going up to its point. It's going to the mission. And when it hits its ceiling, it's popping off to its mission. As you can see, the status on this side, and I have sped up the video, a near real time footage of a 20 minute video is probably not that interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's a little bit faster than it would be in real time. And it's going to its mission and it's taking its photos. So as it goes along its line, you can hear the clicks that it's taking its photos. If you watch down here in the bottom right-hand corner, you can see the angles of the wings as it's doing it. As it takes a photo, it actually rises up a little bit, cuts its engine so there's not any kind of um, noise in the imagery that it's taking, um, and then it drops down again. So as each click, you can see it rising up and you can see it leveling off here. There's also a number of other checks you can have a look at, the battery, um, the temperature, the wind speed, and all of those things. But we're also wanting to look out for things like birds and alerts. So at this point, someone's notified a bird, and I've set in for the fast climb, and we're avoiding that bird. Um, I've slowed it down now so it doesn't kind of run off really fast. And then after the bird has gone away, it's not interested anymore, it continues its mission automatically and continues there. If the bird after that one manoeuvre was still pretty interested in my drone, I would just be frantically pressing all the buttons to get it to roll, to spin, to climb, to go, until the bird realises it's not another bird and then it will fly off. <laughs> so still monitoring everything along here until it's completed its path and then it brings itself back into the home landing point. And it then spirals down to its safe distance eventually. Speed that up a little bit. And then it will bring itself into land on that predefined um, landing zone that I've set it. Landing now. 50. 40. 30. 20. So that's just landed on the ground and it's happy. Disconnect from the drone um, and then I just zoom out to show you all those kind of, all the little footprints that it's taken. So what actually happens when it's landing is at that 10 meter, at that 10 meter height that it's got there, um, what it actually does is cut the engine and it drops or it glides in. Um, so I'll just show you that. Oops, don't mean to do that one. Let's go with this one. As you can see, the drone's quite hard to see when it's a distance. There we go, perfect landing. Thanks, Tim. Um, so this is some of the imagery that we have from the drone. It's not directly streamed from the drone, so we have to download it. On the, on the uh, left here, we have intact forests, a lot of nice forest textures, following natural terrain, natural breaks. Middle, awful deforestation, but you can see on the left-hand side of that what the forest would have looked like. This is probably going to be turned into kind of a rice paddy field. And this is our drone area here. So this is me with my umbrellas keeping the kit out of the sun. We've got our drone camp at the top, and then we've got our toilet in the right-hand corner, which is also very important. Um, the imagery that we have is really important. So this is going to be our precise location of these deforestation areas and showing people the extent of the deforestation in this area. Um, obviously, this area is really important. Um, 
not only have we got areas of kind of high biodiversity and endemism and all those fluffy lemurs which I haven't really quite talked about yet but they exist in this area um, but this this kind of image shows us the ability to extract kind of direct stands that have been lost we can ramp this up and hopefully calculate from this the other areas of forest that have lost that kind of thing this area is most likely probably going to be burnt in situ to either kind of create fertilizer for those um, for the rice paddy fields that go in or it may well be used um, for charcoal so this is another for, um, cut in the forest. So these, these hidden forest cuts um, that nobody else knows, um, thinks that we know that are there. Um, there's nothing pretty about this heart in the forest, and this area of forest probably will not return. Um, and it's quite destructive in this area. Um, but we have an eye in the sky now. Is it a drone? Um, yes, it is. But is it a plane or is it a bird? Um, it is a plane, it's a little mini plane, but it looks like a bird. And even months after we've left the site, um, the local community is still to talking about our drone being out there. The kids are still mimicking the sound and they're still wondering whether we're watching them when they see a bird go past. Of course, we're not watching them because I'm spending hours in front of my desk here now processing all this massive information that I've got back. So this is seven gigabytes of data in this kind of base map they've created. Um, that was generated from 40 gigs of photos that were recorded in the field. And you can see here, this is kind of a, um, a zoom in area of that. Um, you can see the detail. Um, these kind of patches that you see are kind of slightly shaded. That's because there's different illuminations, um, but the software does a pretty good job. But this is the base map from what um, all the current deforestation we monitored, and we can identify those kind of logging areas. That was the cut that I showed you from before. Um, but in addition to that, historic losses. Can we then calculate what has been lost before and what will be lost in the future? Um, that future losses, and that will be um, undertaken by the teams on the ground with kind of forest alert, so an early warning system. So that's the GLAD system that's run by University of Maryland and um, supported by Global Forest Watch. And they produce 30 metre resolution data from Landsat to give you an early warning of a forest cut. And that's a weekly product. So the rangers on the ground here have a Forest Watcher app. They can go to those locations, did the alert trigger what is actually a cut? And they can actually go and then have a look and see if that's a cut. They can protect the forest. They can um, go and monitor those particular areas. So that's really important for them to have that data and that resource. So that's kind of what's happening in the forest in the future. Um, but other than this being a very pretty picture, there's tons more work for me to do. Kind of on the science side of things, there's loads of information. So I said to you, we had essentially um, the ability to create 3D models and 3D fly-throughs, and that's what people understand, and these are the kind of things that we want to look at. Can't, haven't done it for this data yet, because I'm still processing, but I have done it for some other data in Madagascar. So this is another area in Madagascar. You can see this is kind of the, the terrain area of a point cloud. Um, what this shows you is you can actually extract the volume of a loss. So this is a loss, um, obviously, of, of earth and erosion, but you can kind of relate the same thing to forests. Um, also, I'm just going to show you um, last as I kind of work out, um, is the 3D fly-throughs. Now, 3D fly-throughs are great because they show people the world that they understand. Um, this looks like really nice forest texture, and as we fly in, you'll realise it starts getting a little bit confusing because what this is is actually a point cloud, and on top of that point cloud, we have the projected image on top of it. Um, so you can see that when we go in closely and it doesn't really look like a forest anymore. Um, but as you zoom out, it looks really nice. But it's very difficult to extract those volume metrics from something like this, which is a point cloud. However, it's a lot easier to pull those metrics from something like this. It's a big data, why it's a little bit blocky. Um, but you can see when you create a surface from those points, um, it actually has extruded them. So it looks, the trees look more like kind of mini um, kind of skyscrapers than they do trees, but this is kind of generate a surface. So it shows you some of the things that we can do with this data. And this is exactly kind of the information that I'm going to be extracting to kind of combine um, some of this research into the science and to really pull out what's been happening in these areas, um, the deforestation and to help with conservation in the future. Thank you.